All right. Is everything fine? All right. All right. One, two, three. Everyone can hear me. Great. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Robert Wozniak, and I'm a lead engineer at Tropil um, in the UK. And um, today, uh, we're going to talk about leading development teams and how to swim and do not drown. Let's take a look um, what's in today. So today, we're going to talk about what does it mean to lead development teams. Um, this is going to be a short intro. And um, second one is going to be team communication, um, team trust and alignment, balance between control and freedom, teamwork, the monkey, one of my favorite ones. And at the end, we're going to touch approach to code reviews. All right, so what does it mean to lead development teams? So we've got five significant points. The first one is the trust. So when you're thinking about trust, um, you should ask yourself two vital questions. Do you trust your team? And do your team trust you? Because if there is no mutual trust, um, the cooperation is not going to work as you expect it to do. The second one is motivate. So in my opinion, when you are a lead, your responsibility is to give your team the strength and lift them up wherever you can. This, the third one is give a chance. So being a lead um, gives you an opportunity to change lives, actually. It gives you an opportunity to change lives. So by giving a chance, you might achieve something with your team that is going to be amazing and it won't be forgotten. The fourth one is mentor. So apart from actually giving a chance, um, you should act as a mentor. So tell your team members um, what they've done wrong, uh, what they can improve, be honest with them, and have an impact on their knowledge and the career progression every day. The fifth one and the last one is communicate. Um, so if you are a lead, there is no place for dishonesty. Transparency and honesty should be the first ones in the queue if you're leading the team every day. And communicate uh, leads us to the second point, which is team communication. So team communication covers two subtopics, delivering sensitive news and communicating criticism and appreciation. So delivering sensitive news, um, the first point is prepare words carefully. So before you actually stand in front of your team and other people uh, when delivering sensitive news, when something happened or something is going to happen, um, you should take a note of the words you're going to, to say. Because they might have an emotional impact on your team members and on other people who's going to listen to it. And the second thing is to prepare questions that your team might ask you while you're delivering the sensitive news. Because it is important because um, if they ask the question, they expect you at this very moment to give the right answer. So it's best if you prepare the words and prepare the questions, as many as you can. The second one is who receives information. Well, this one is um, is important one in terms of the time of the developers. So let's say that um, mate from the from the team A. Uh, left or is going to leave and um, he's got strong relationships with some people and there is also team B uh, and this this person didn't have for example um, a strong relationship with team B okay so you're not gonna bother team B with this news you're just not gonna go to them you're not gonna schedule the meeting with them to tell them all right the mate from the team A is leaving so you're just gonna, if, if you do that, you're going to waste their valuable time. And also, how can you know that actual, that actual team, the mate from the team A, is uh, not having strong relationship with the mates from the team B? Um, well, as a lead, you should observe every day. You should see who they've got strong relationships with. The third one is who will be affected. This one is the important one. Um, so let's say that um, in one of the teams you've got Dave and Jack, 
and Jack is leaving, but he's a friend of Dave, all right? But he didn't tell Dave that he's leaving, so imagine if you deliver this sensitive news, how is it going to affect Dave and how shocked Dave will be, all right? So it might bring his motivation down and it might bring him down totally, uh, so he's not gonna be able to work for a little bit um, properly. So what you're gonna do? You should go to Dave and actually tell him individually, face to face, that this is something what you're going to announce and that Jack is going to leave the company. All right? So then Dave can leave with that and, and before you actually, and when you deliver the news, uh, he's gonna know about it and he's gonna be okay because he processed this before when you told him. The second part of team communication is communicating criticism and appreciation. So we've got feedback diagram, and this feedback diagram um, is going to help you to prepare yourself for the feedback face-to-face -face, uh, with the team member. So we've got first, first step, it's observation of behavior. So before you proceed to have the, to have the feedback face-to-face -face with a team member, um, you should observe his behaviors. You should take a note in your personal notebook what you've noticed, what he's done, um, and have these observations noticed, um, noted on the, in your notebook somewhere, uh, have the notes. And this one is gonna lead you to the second step, which is an impact of the behavior. So let's say you've got the notes related to observations of the behavior, and then you write the consequences of this behavior, the impact that it was having, for example, let's say the project managers on the teams on uh, the entire project, or maybe on himself, on the deaf who you're gonna be talking to. So once you've got these two steps, it's gonna lead you to the third one, which is advice and or question, okay? So you've collected observation and impact of the behavior, so now the third step is during the face-to-face -face, um, feedback with one of the folks from your team. So based on observation and the impact, you can give an advice and receive more information related to it and also ask the question, which is gonna give you answers that you want to get from the person. Also, advice and a question combined together uh, is best. And it allows you to proceed to the last step, which is feedback. So you've got observation, impact, you talk to him, uh, you got an answer uh, from, uh, by you know, giving him advice and you got something that he told you and also by asking the question you got everything he wanted and um, yeah, you're actually providing the feedback based on all of the three steps and the knowledge you've gathered. And it takes us to the third one, which is team trust and realignment. So team trust and realignment consists of two methods. Uh, the first one is support and protection. Um, let me tell you a little bit about support. So we've got support uh, tells you to spend three to five minutes, three, two to three days per week actually with each team member. But that applies to leads who lead uh, teams, five to 10 developers, because if you lead developers, um, because if you lead the teams that have 20 developers, let's say, you might not be able to do that. Um, you might try to do it once per week, once or once per two weeks. That might work, but if it doesn't, uh, you might try Slack. Uh, you might try to Slack them, ask them uh, multiple questions, how they're doing, uh, what they're working on, how are they feeling, if they need any help, uh, how can they improve, uh, how you can help them to improve, actually. And yeah. But I lead actually smaller teams. I lead five to 10 developers. So I've got this opportunity to uh, do it face to face, um, two to three days per week. The second one is protection. So protection is about being protective over your team. So you have to make them feel that they can rely on you and that you are there for them every day, wherever they need you. So I'll tell you now about um, a little experiment that I've, I've conducted when I've been working, um, when I've been leading one of the teams. So the experiment was uh, before I actually started applying support method, um, I've been uh, measuring the 
kind of performance and task deliverance within sprints. It was normally two weeks. So the task deliverance within sprints was 70%. Okay? But then, surprisingly, when I started applying support, it just went through the roof and it was by 15%. So it suddenly started hitting 85% task deliverance within sprints when I started applying support. So what it tells me is that the contact and that you care about your team can have an effect. The second one, which is protection, let me tell you one situation. Mm. So I've been leading one of the teams in one of the countries, and then there was a junior dev, and she was, uh, of course she was junior, she was inexperienced, but she had knowledge already to, to deliver tasks. So she was working on, on tasks, and as far as I remember, <clears throat> she couldn't deliver it on time, so the project manager came to her, and what happened is they had a conversation, but then she came back to the desk crying. Okay? She came back to the desk crying, and then I had, I had this thought, how can my dev, how can the dev from my team come, to, come back to the desk after the conversation with the project manager and cry? And then I had this, I had this impulse inside, the protective impulse to protect her, so then I took her for a really, really quick conversation because I didn't want to bother her because she was already having tears in her eyes. So what happened was I asked her what happened. I got the information. She came back to the desk, and I asked project manager for a minute of conversation. And then we talked, and we got to, to the point where we decided that this is never going to happen again. So I spent maybe eight to 10 minutes uh, pro, by, by I spent eight to ten minutes on protecting one of my team members and having the conversation with the project manager, and it never happened again. Eight to ten minutes, and I resolved the situation, and it never happened again. Never. The fourth one, we've got balance between control and freedom. So here, I'm going to introduce you four leadership methods that you can apply, or maybe you know someone who is already doing that. The first one we're going to talk about is abdication. So abdication applies to leaders who, who's got hands-on, and they lead the team. I mean, they've been assigned to lead the team, but they don't really have time to do that. I mean, it's not their fault. It might be because they are overloaded with the tasks, um, so they, they just don't have time to do that. So abdication is kind of like, you don't assign tasks to your team. They have to choose on their own based on priorities. Um, the second thing is uh, you don't support. You don't offer much support because you just don't have time for that. And also, um, you don't control and you don't monitor what they do, actually. So it might get out of hands um, when you apply application to leading your team. The second one is empowerment. Where empowerment is not much different, but it's got one um, different point that applies to abdication. So the difference is, in abdication, you don't offer support, you don't monitor, and you don't assign tasks. In empowerment, on the other hand, you offer support wherever you can. So you offer support, but still, you don't assign tasks, you don't have control, you don't monitor, but you support, all right? There is at least one improvement. The third one is delegating. So what happens here? I do use it every day. It works really well. Um, so I'll tell you the first, uh, which is it applies to juniors and mid-level devs. So by using delegating, you assign the task to the dev based on the priorities and the difficulty of the task. You offer support every day, wherever, wherever you can. Um, you monitor what they do. And you also ask them to consult it with you, which, on the, which in, a, in a dev language means, all right, I want to see your pull request, all right? Um, so the second thing is, in terms of senior devs, uh, you let, you give, you're giving them a kind of freedom, so you're um, letting them decide uh, what tasks they're going to choose based on, based on the priorities. But the rest stays the same, which is you offer support uh, you monitor what they do, and uh, you also want to consult with them the pull request. The last one, which is sharing, um, 
this is more of a leadership style, not a method. So what you can do, we as leaders, we've got this responsibility that we decide about the architecture and all of the solutions. So what happens is here, when you're using sharing, you're losing 100% of your responsibilities. So 50% is on your side and 50% is on your team's side. So what you do is you're just taking your team together and you all decide about the architecture. You're, it, is really, it, it, is, it is really motivating for them and it tells them that you need them and that they can shape the actual architecture of the project in the future. Um, and also you're giving them a chance. The last one from the balance between control and freedom is delegate at 80%. So what happens here? Let's say that you're leading the team, and, but you've got hands-on. So you've got two tasks to deliver within a week frame, okay? But task A, you've delivered at 80%, but then it's still task B that is waiting for you to be started. So what's going to happen? You're gonna find a team member who is gonna be able to finish 20% left of your task and then you can jump on the task B and try to deliver it on time. The fifth one, this is teamwork, the monkey. So will the monkey jump on your back? And how to stop the monkey? Well, this is my favorite one. I'll explain you in three steps how you can avoid taking the monkey on your back and how you can actually resolve really specific issues. The first one is suggestion. All right, so now let's say that um, Jack, one of your developers, is coming to you and he's saying, hey, listen, Rob, I don't think I can finish this task. I need your help. Can you do it for me, please? And you say, hmm, yeah, all right. Leave it with me, Jack, leave it with me. And then you see what's happening. You're saying, leave it with me, so you're taking monkey on your back. You're taking full responsibility of his task on your back. So you have to deliver that, not him anymore. It's you. So instead of saying, all right, leave it with me, I'm going to do it for you, um, you can say, you can offer a suggestion and say, what if you do it in that way, and did you try this way? Uh, what if you can approach it in a different way? All right? So lead him to the solution, but don't give it to him, all right? Suggest where is the solution. Give him a path, but don't tell him that. Give him a suggestion, and then say that you're gonna follow up with that, for example, at the end of the day or tomorrow morning, uh, so you can see where he's at, okay? The second one is the plan. Wow, plan. That's something bigger. That's something that is not like a task. It's something way bigger. So plan, uh, let's say that you gave a task, because you're giving a chance as a lead, as we talked about it, give a chance. So you're giving a chance to someone, uh, let's say to Jack, you're giving a chance to Jack, to come up with the basic architecture of the project, all right? But then Jack is struggling and he's coming to you and he's saying that he needs help um, if you can help him to come up with this plan. But then you're looking, you learned, you learned that you're not gonna say to leave it with him, to leave it with, with me, you're not gonna say leave it with me. Um, so you're just gonna ask him, for example, that's this example question, how much time will it take for you to come up with this plan, with this plan of basic architecture? And then he's gonna say, um, I need day more or two, two days more? And then you're gonna say, all right, all right, listen, Jack, tomorrow, tomorrow morning, I'll give you one day more, and tomorrow morning I'll, I'll, I'll come and take a look how you're doing, and uh, we'll see what we can do then. And then Jack is well, leaving happy. He's got one more day. He's probably going to come up uh, with the plan because it uh, seems like he seems motivated. You're giving him more time, chance, and he sees the opportunity in actually designing the basic architecture of the project. But there might be two situations that's going to happen. The first one is he's going to do it. Everyone's happy. No problem. The second one is that he's not going to do it or he's gonna do it and he's gonna be halfway through this. So, when you're gonna come to him, you can sit with him. If you've got a time, 
to plan this. But if you don't, you might want to uh, try to find an actual experienced dev who's uh, free to sit with him, pair with him, and, and try to come up with a plan. The third one is authority. All right, so pass on authority. So let's assume a situation that, where we've got Dave and we've got Jack, okay? And Jack is coming to you and he's saying, Rob, I've got 80% task done, but I need to, f I've got the 20% left depends on a designer, on Dave, but he doesn't have time to schedule this with me. All right, and then you're thinking, all right, Let's go. So you're taking Jack to the, to the designer, actually, and then you're asking Dave, hey, listen, um, we've got kind of tight schedule. Could you schedule the meeting with Jack? He really needs you to finish this task. And then Dave might schedule this, might actually schedule, because you're passing on authority. See what it means? It means that if you as a lead coming to him, it means for Dave, it means that it's something really serious, that you, you really need it right now. Um, so, and then Dave is scheduling the meeting. Jack is leaving happy, you're leaving happy. Everyone's all right. The last one, which is approach to code reviews. Um, me as a lead, I've been reviewing uh, tons of, of code and um, tons of pull requests. And this is from my uh, personal experience. So the first one is extensive feedback. All right, so always, always, when I when I review pull requests, I always provide huge feedback, um, as many details as I can to explain the dev, to actually let him learn from these pull requests on how to do it in a proper way, all right? But do not overdo. If you see that it is, you're writing a book, basically, do not do it, don't do it. Write as much as you can, but also provide the links that can you know, help the deaf to see your point um, and increase his knowledge. The second one is 500 lines of code. Yeah, this one is, uh, this one is awful sometimes. So what happens is, um, at many times I've received pull requests where I, where I had to review 500 lines of code, and it's like, you're just scrolling down, you're just scrolling down, you're just scrolling down, and there's 500 lines of code all the time, all the time, all the time, oh my goodness, all right? So, do not review 500, 500 lines of code. Don't, do not do that. Um, but review as many as you can, as many as you can. I'd say you're gonna start getting maybe tired at 300, 250, or even 200. It really depends on uh, uh, how you're feeling, right? How you're feeling at this very moment. Um, so try to review as many as you can. And let's say that you've got two more pull requests, but the second one is having 50 lines and the third one is having 150. So what you're gonna do to avoid having stuck of pull requests um, and delaying the process, you can review, for example, 200 or 250 lines of code and then jump on a second pull request, the 50 lines of code, you can finish that, approve or request change, and then you're gonna finish, and finish one and take it off the stack, and then you're gonna have uh, these 500 lines of code left for tomorrow, and yeah. Don't, don't review 500 lines of code because you might be um, too tired. And then uh, if you have to do more tasks during the day, you're not gonna be effective, as effective as you, as you want to be. The third one is tiredness and inability to concentrate. All right, um, do not do that, seriously. Don't sit to do code reviews while you're tired or you can't concentrate. I've done that many times. I've learned, I've made mistakes and let me tell you like that, you're gonna skim through the code, <laughs> you're gonna miss the details, um, you're not gonna provide extensive feedback enough for the deaf to actually learn from that. Um, yeah, you're, the code review is not gonna be good while you're tired. So if you've got this problem that you can't review it because you can't concentrate or delegate it to someone else or leave it for tomorrow, it's better to leave this pull request for tomorrow then review it when you're tired and you can't concentrate. The fourth one is morning routine. So what I've noticed is I've just made morning routine as my habit. So every morning I come to the office, I just review pull requests because I'm fresh, 
I've got the ability to focus a lot and I just, I just made it as my habit because I feel like it's a good practice because in the morning I'm full of strength, I can provide a lot of feedback, I can motivate, I can teach, I can mentor my team members. The fifth one is delegate reviews. So, let me tell you the situation. So, when I've been leading one of the teams, imagine the table, imagine the table, and they were, they, they were sitting kind of around me, and I've been sitting with them, and what I've been doing, I've been delegating code reviews to each one of them, and then what I've noticed after some time, I can't really say how much time it took, but what I've noticed after some time was just they all started writing in the same style. They all started writing in the same style. It was an, and I, for me, it was an amazing achievement because I saw that actually delegating code reviews works and they all learn. No matter juniors, mid or seniors, they all start writing in the same styles. Of course, seniors were more experienced, they were trying to use different patterns, mid-level as well, but juniors were learning a lot from that. The sixth one is pair code reviews. All right, so what I've done is um, I paired junior and senior dev together, all right, to review someone else's code. So what happened was, surprisingly, senior learned from junior. But usually it's the other way around, but junior learned from senior. So what happened was um, juniors are fresh, they study all the time, they are really eager, high motivation, they want to learn as much as they can. So, Junior is looking, Junior is looking at this code and he's saying, hey, you know what, I think we can do it in that way. I read this and that and that. And the senior is saying, hey, you know what? Yeah, that's great. Let's do this that way. That's surprising, but it happens. And it happened when I've been leading the team. Um, but yeah, all the other way around happens more often, which is senior is actually uh, teaching the junior. Um, but yeah, that's how I was approaching pair code reviews. And that would be it for today. Um, on the surface of the water, leading development teams. Um, thank you for, for coming and listening to me. Uh, you can follow me on social media. You can also, if you want, visit my personal blog and you can subscribe to the newsletter. No spam. Um, thank you, that's all.